This sermon is titled The Normal Christian Life. Be enriched as you listen. So this whole uh, month we've been uh, studying different topics, right? We've been looking at uh, the glory of God. We looked at uh, the God kind of life, Zoe, the God kind of life. And uh, last Sunday we also studied about waiting uh, on God, waiting for God, waiting on God. Um, so this Sunday, today, we're going to look at uh, this message, uh, which is titled, The Normal Christian Life. Okay, The Normal Christian Life. So just turn to your neighbor and say, be normal. I'm going to say it with, uh, you know, some, some emotion, you know, maybe like an Italian, like, be normal. <laughs> right? Be normal. We are called to be normal. And we are called to live the normal Christian life. And I'm sure, you know, as you, as you and I, you know, when you came to the Lord and you received the Lord as Savior, uh, we, we, we actually stepped into a whole new universe, right? Different words, different vocabulary. Uh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. You know, I still remember somebody, uh, you know, I was on the phone and somebody has said, uh, you know, praise the Lord, brother. And I'm just waiting, you know, I'm not used to it. I'm saying, yeah, you know, who is it? I don't even know who it is. And so we, we got exposed to a you know, whole new world. And, it, and then, you know, you got to know about uh, spiritual Christians, normal Christians, nominal Christians, and, you know, all that. Anyone? You know, backslidden Christians, lukewarm. Hey, that's, a, that's something that's a water or something, but, but a lukewarm Christian and so on, right? So, so maybe... At some point, we ask, who is a normal Christian? And if so, what is the normal Christian life? Right. With all this going around and, you know, all these labels and, and to top it all, all denominations, and, you know, Methodist, CS, Anglican, oh, I just want to be a normal Christian. Anybody with that cry? <laughs> yes. Okay, we are all in the right place, <laughs> right? So today is about the normal Christian life, okay? So it's good to understand, uh, you know, where does this word even come from, Christian? Uh, do you know that there's only thrice in the Bible that the word Christian is used, right? And it's all in the New Testament, the first time when <clears throat> in the church in Antioch, when the disciples were first called Christians. So that's the first time. The second time where... Uh, Paul and Agrippa have this conversation and King Agrippa says, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Right? And the third place where we see is um, where Peter writing to the church and they are going through all kinds of trouble and persecution. And he says, you know, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Right? So we see in these three places this term Christian. But let's look at the first place where it is used. Right? In the church in Antioch and and this is what we read in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. It says, and when he had found him, when Barnabas found Paul, it says, he brought him to Antioch so that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The disciples were first called Christians. And, you know, some of the historian theologians say that maybe it was used in a derogatory way, you know, like a label. Oh, these are Christians, right? So the disciples were first called Christians. So that's something for us to understand. Okay, it's not something that I'm born into. It's not something that I sign up for. But, you know, I need to be a disciple in order to be called a Christian. Now, I might have a name like Peter and Andrew and James and John, but that doesn't make me a Christian. I think we understand that, right? Uh, I might be a church-going person, but that doesn't make me a Christian, right? So I need to be a follower. I need to receive the Lord as Lord and Savior. I need to be a disciple because the disciples were first called Christians. Now, it could mean many things, but if you look at the roots, that is what it is. The disciples were first called Christians. So... We can conclude, a normal Christian is a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Yes or no? A normal Christian is a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Okay. So, the question is, hey, who is a disciple? A normal Christian is a disciple. Who is a disciple? And we know, 
A disciple is one who follows. A disciple of the Lord Jesus is one who follows the Lord Jesus, follows the teachings of the Lord Jesus, maybe principles and precepts, but not just, just the teachings, not just the principles and precepts, but continues to hear the voice of the teacher. All of us, you know, we are designed to hear the voice of the shepherd. So continues to hear the voice of the shepherd and continue, continues on to obey the presence, the voice, the principles and the precepts, right? So it's an ongoing thing. It's a, it's a, a lively, vibrant relationship to be a disciple. So this is who a disciple is. So as we go through the word of God and particularly the teachings of the Lord Jesus, we see that the Lord describes who a disciple is. You know, he says, he talks about one particular attribute and he says, this is who a disciple is. This is who a disciple, you know, uh, this is who a disciple is not and so on. So when we look at the teaching, so we, because we can define, I can say, this is how I see myself as a disciple. We can give our own definitions, right? In fact, the world also would give many other definitions. You know, someone who meditates, someone who goes on a pilgrimage, someone who wakes up early, someone who stays up late, someone who chants something over and over again. The world can define, give its own definition of who a disciple is. But what is the Lord saying? You know, in His teachings, in his, uh, in, in his word, what is he saying? Who is a disciple? So let's take some time to, to look at the characteristics or the identification marks of a disciple. So we're answering the question, who is a disciple, right? So let's look at the first thing. The first thing is that the disciple follows the Lord willingly, right? A disciple follows the Lord willingly. Yes, there could be some challenges, there could be some, some questions, some doubts, but the disciple follows the Lord willingly. And uh, this is a scene that we see in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 18 onwards. We see that the Lord Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee and he sees Peter and Andrew. And what are they doing? They are in the fishing business. They are casting the, the sea, they are casting the nets into the sea. So he sees them and he says, follow me. And the word of God says that immediately they left and they followed. Next, he looks at John, uh, James and John, and he looks at the, and, and then uh, he, he tells the same thing. He calls them, verse 21, and immediately they left and they followed. So we, we know that a disciple is one who willingly follows the Lord, right? Not grudgingly, not kicking and screaming and... You know, maybe we can do that for a season, but we come to that place of willingly following the Lord Jesus, right? The second thing that we see is that the disciple <clears throat> esteems the Word of God and obeys the Word of God. Esteems meaning respects, honors the Word of God and obeys the Word of God. You know, John chapter 8 and verse 31, this is what the Lord says. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So he's made it very plain, very clear. If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. So what does it mean to abide? It means to stay. It means to dwell. It means to continue. Continue with what? Continue to hear the word. Continue to do the word of God. Apply the word of God in all our life situations. Now there could be times when it's convenient, there could be times when it's inconvenient, there could be seasons that are difficult, but through it all, abide in my word, that instruction means that even through those changing seasons and times and ups and downs of life, a disciple abides in the word of God. And this is normal for a Christian, right? So the Lord is redefining what is normal. He's saying, this is normal. Because this is who a normal Christian is. And this is who a disciple is, right? So, uh, one more verse. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. In the Great Commission, this is what the Lord says, right? He says, he gives the commission, go preach the gospel. In verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So basically, he's saying, as you go and disciple, you teach them to obey or observe all the things that I have taught you, I have commanded you. 
So a disciple obeys the word of God, holds fast to all that is commanded in the word of God. It's very plain, it's very clear. Thirdly, the disciple walks in the love of God. The disciple walks in the love of God. And this is what the Lord says, John 13 and verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another. Right? He qualifies that love. As I have loved you. What is that love? The agape God kind of love. And he's saying, you love one another with this kind of love. And he says, by this, verse 35, by this, all will know. Right? By this, all will know. Know what? That you are my disciples. So it's very clear. You love one another. So loving one another is not just a... It's just not just a good idea. It's a noble thing to do. But the Lord says, hey, if you love one another, and he qualifies it by saying, as I have loved you, is that an easy thing or a difficult thing? Yeah, we know what it is, right? But the th beautiful thing is this. Romans 5 and verse 5, it says that the love of God, which is agape, the God kind of love, has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has already resourced us, empowered us with His love. Right? So if you, before we say, hey, it's too high an ideal, it's, it's too high, I can't live up to it. Well, the Lord says, I've already poured it, the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you love one another, which means it's an expectation, it's a command. And He says, by this all will know that you are my disciple. So this love is, is, is saying, no, this is one of the marks of a disciple, but by this, all will know as well, right? Fourthly, the disciple pursues fruitfulness in life, okay? John chapter 15, verse five, the Lord says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in, I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Let's look at verse eight. It says, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. The last part of it, he says, so you will be my disciples. So that connection between us abiding in the vine, us being fruitful, and like we studied, it's a God kind of life, the zoe that flows in the vine onto the branches, and we are the fruit-bearing part of that of that uh, of the branch and he's saying you will bear fruit what is that fruit fruits of righteousness fruits of holiness you know fruits of uh, anything that we can see in all realms of our life whether it's our marriage or whether it's business whether it's our profession that we will be fruitful that we will be productive because of the God kind of life flowing in us and through us amen so he's not saying you fend for yourself but he's saying this is the kind of life that is flowing in you, the Zoe, the God kind of life, so you will bear fruit. And, and the disciple is called to be fruitful. So it's normal for a disciple to be fruitful. Amen. And the, and the same passage also says, the father comes to prune. Now gardeners will know, you know you're always pruning something, you know. And if you see something dead, your hands are twitching, right? Gardeners. Oh, but, uh, we recently had one workshop, lunch, women's luncheon on gardening. I believe it was, it was amazing, right? You, you're reaching for that shear. You're reaching, you know, I want to pull it out. Why? Because so that the plant can be even more productive. And the Father does the pruning so that we can be even more productive, even more fruitful, right? So that's another mark of a disciple, to pursue fruitfulness, to undergo pruning, and a few more things here, the marks of a disciple. The disciple endeavors to be like Jesus. I'm sure people have asked you, people have told you, who are you, trying to be like a saint? No, I'm trying to be like Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Blasphemy. How can you say that? How can you do that? But the Lord says this, is, is, you know, in many places, he says, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, or like the master, right? 
Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, it's 40, it says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So what is that expectation to be perfectly trained? What is that expectation? Oh, you need to be perfectly trained to be like me. So here is a good thing that the Lord desires us to be like him. The Lord desires us to be like him. So just think of Jesus, how he ministered, what he did. And he's looking at the disciple and he's saying, I want you to be like me. I want you to be perfectly trained like me and, and uh, trained and so that you can be like me. And so who trains us, who teaches us and who equips us? You know, that word perfectly trained means thoroughly equipped. Thoroughly equipped is the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So the thing is that God desires to teach us. God desires to train us. God desires, he's saying, you know, I want to mentor you. I've heard of people, you know, speaking in very, um, very noble terms about their mentors, you know, saying that so-and-so is my mentor. There's so much of pride and saying, hey, this is a person of experience. This is a person who's accomplished many things. And so-and-so, you know, he or she is my mentor. But the Lord is saying, you know, I want to be your mentor. I want to mentor you. I want to thoroughly equip you so that you can be like me. Isn't it awesome? Praise God. So that's one of the marks of a disciple who says, who makes a diligent effort to be like Jesus. Who wants to be taught because the Lord is desiring to teach who wants to be trained because the master is desiring to train. So you and I, that's one of the mark of a disciple. Two more things about disciples. The disciple follows the Lord willingly despite the cost. We know there is a cost. You know, the cost could be ridicule. The cost could be discomfort. The cost could be shame. Uh, and in some parts of the world, the cost could be your life itself. Right? It's a high cost. It's a high calling. And this is what the Lord says, Matthew chapter 16. He's not holding back anything. He's saying, hey, I'm just making it plain. There is a cost attached. Matthew 16 and verse 24. The, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, yes, the Lord has come to give us life and life in its fullness, in all spheres, in all realms of our life. He's not the one to steal and kill and destroy. That's the, uh, that's the agenda of the enemy. But he has come that we might have life. And in following him, he says, if anyone desires to come, he, there is a denying that happens, denying of the self. And there is a cost to be paid. And Paul, when he's talking about the cross and when he's talking about his own, uh, his own journey, uh, Acts 21 and verse 13, he says, he's testifying, he's saying, I'm ready not only to be bound. Because people are saying, Paul, if you go there, if you go back to Jerusalem, there's chains, there's persecutions, there's prison sentence, you know, don't go. But Paul says, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So these are a different breed of people, the disciples. And the last one about the mark of a disciple. The disciple is not ashamed of the gospel. The disciple is not embarrassed about Jesus. You know, in church, we are proud. Our language is different. But in a different social setting or an environment, when somebody, somebody asks that question, you know, why is it that you don't drink or smoke? Why is it that you're making this choice? Are we embarrassed? Right? And there was a point in my life where I was embarrassed. You know, I was in college and I had I'd just become a believer and, and all that. And, but I just still wanted to belong, you know, belong to the group, still wanted to be cool, was part of the band and all that. And, and I remember someone asking me, hey, do you, do you actually believe in this stuff? Right, because it's referring to something else and some other discussion. Do you also believe? And, um, you know, I was ashamed to say that I, I didn't give an S or no. I just said, mm, yeah. 
that kind of a thing. But a disciple is not embarrassed, is not ashamed. Why? Paul says, why? Romans 1 and verse 16, he says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This good news that Jesus came, Jesus lived a sin sinless life. He carried my sin, my sickness on the cross, and he died for me. He rose again. This gospel, I'm not ashamed at all. Why? He says, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. It is the power of God. Because there's nothing else that can save man. And that's why, you know, when we pray for, you know, for the nations, we know the enormity of the task and we know that there's nothing else. There is no plan B. There is no reform or self-help or, you know, doing all those things. It is not going to save man from the clutches of sin. It is only the gospel. It is only the power of the cross. It is only that power of the cross which can destroy, which has destroyed the power of sin. So a disciple sh shares the gospel despite the ridicule, knowing it is the power of God to save. Amen. And we are enjoying salvation. We are enjoying the peace of God. We are enjoying this fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Let us not be embarrassed to share Jesus. So these are some marks of the disciple. And we said, hey, this is normal for a disciple. Right? So this is normal for a Christian. So turn to your neighbor and say, be a normal Christian. Come on, say it. It's, you just preach it to them. Be a normal Christian. Yeah. You know, this is the invitation for us to be a normal Christian, which is the life of a disciple. Right? And the beautiful thing is, we might think, hey, this is too lofty. This is too difficult. Uh, I'm not there yet, but the Holy Spirit will help us. The Holy Spirit will empower us. Because that's what the Lord Jesus said. I'm not leaving you alone, but the helper, the paraclete, he will come. He will help. He will empower. He will walk with us. He walks with us. Right? So the question is, hey, what is the normal Christian life? I live in Bangalore. People all around live for the weekend. I'm also living for the weekend. You know, I'm coming here and, you know, listening to the word and sharing and all that. And what? So what is the normal Christian life, really? And can we even call it normal? Right? So let's look at a few uh, scriptures which talk about the normal Christian life. These are lives of disciples. These are things that we, we infer from Scripture. And uh, the first one that we see is that the normal Christian life is a life of faith. The normal Christian life is a life of faith. Right? And um, this is a scene. The Lord Jesus, he has resurrected from the dead. And he has told some of his disciples, go tell the others. He's told in the garden, he's told Mary, go tell the others. Um, that I am I'm alive. I was dead, but I'm alive. Go tell them. And so they go and tell them, and uh, not many people are convinced. Right? It's like, maybe you've been thinking about this too much. You know, it's just my imagination. And we all know his name, Thomas. And he says, I don't know about you guys, but unless I see the Lord, unless I put my finger in his wounds and touch his side, I will not believe. Right? And so the Lord makes an appearance. They're all sitting. It's a closed room. The doors are closed. He's there. What a grand entry. And he says, fear not, because they're all now scared. Hey, he was dead. Now he's alive. But he's walking through doors and walking through walls now. And he says, do not fear. And then he turns his attention to Thomas. Oh, Thomas knows what's coming. You know, he says, Thomas... See my hands. No. It says, reach your finger. John 20 verse 21, 27. Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. So Thomas, at that point, he just had to believe the testimony of those eyewitnesses. They said, we saw the Lord. He is alive. They just, he just had to believe that testimony, right? And which was the words of the Lord. He says, go tell them. And the Lord says, Thomas, don't be unbelieving, but believing. And he goes on to say, 
Thomas answers and says, my Lord and my God. And he's having a worship moment there. My Lord, my God. We can just imagine that, right? And verse 29, Jesus says to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Right? Blessed are those who have not yet seen or not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, who have not you know, not had this kind of encounter, Thomas, but they are hearing the testimony, they are hearing the witness, they are hear hearing eyewitness accounts. Blessed are, are those who have not seen, but yet have believed. Right? So the life of a disciple, he's talking to the disciples, this is your life, a believing life. So faith in God is to be assured, it is to have the title deed or confirmation of the things that are guaranteed by him. To consider as evidence or proof the things that are not yet manifest to our physical senses. Now that's the difficult part. God, I don't see it yet. All I have is your word. All I have is the prompting of the spirit. All I have is your promise. All I have is your quickened word, which you're reiterating over and over again. All I have are these, O oh God. But the Lord says, Blessed are those who have not yet not seen and yet have believed. Also want to say that, <clears throat> you know, it's impossible to please the Lord without faith. So faith is a requirement for us to please Him. But faith is also not a life of presumption and assumptions, right? Faith is not saying, I'm going to leave my logic and reason and everything aside. No, no. The Lord says, let us reason together. In fact, to Thomas, he said, Thomas, I'm giving you this proof. Right? And faith is a requirement for the disciple to please the Lord, who lives to please the Lord. So it's not a presumptuous life. It's not a life of assumption. And this presumption and assumption is actually a work of the flesh. Just think about it. Right? Faith is something that produced in our spirit when we receive the word of God. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit which we receive from God. It's something spiritual. So if it's an assumption, it is a work of stirring of the flesh. So it is a life of faith. Amen. And the word of the Lord for this year, conquer through, conquer through faith. Subdue your adversaries and take down your Jerichos. No, it's not, not just a word for the, for the word of the Lord for the year, but it is a life of the disciple. It is a life of a normal Christian. Amen? So the second thing that we see that it is a word-centered life. It's a word-centered life, which means the word, the Bible, the word of God, and also the quickened word. It is a word that is centered around, it's a life that is centered around the word of God. Just think about it. It is a life that is prioritized, where we give priority to the word of God, to understanding the word of God, to making space to listen, to read, to, to receive the word of God, and, and also to put to practice the word of God. Amen. It's a word-centered life. In other words, it's not a self centered life but it's a word centered life which means God is at the center his word is at the center his thoughts his ideas his opinions on every matter that is at the center that is at the priority of our lives so we we use it to define how we want to live we it, it defines in fact the way we live God live our lives the Lord Jesus said this he said man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. So we know that physically we can live. We can live by bread. We can live. And I'm sure that, you know, um, all of us can exist, you know, without it, but then with, with, uh, with food and, but the Lord says, you know, but every word that proceeds, that is a spiritual food that every human being needs that a disciple needs it's a spiritual food in other words he's saying you know as a disciple as food is for the physical body so is the quickened word for the spiritual nourishment of the disciple right so i'm sure that all of us are making plans for lunch right even right now 
you made plans already. You know, this is where we are going. Last week, we went to that restaurant, but this week we are going there. Right? We all made plans. And some of us are, you know, we'll make plans as we go. You know, we'll see, the Lord will lead. <laughs> right? But we make plans for physical food. Right? We look forward to the next meal. Right? And so, when it comes to spiritual food, you know, where are we? You know, I'm just challenging myself. Do we make that do we make plans? Okay, today I'm going to read this. You know, I, I want to make sure that I understand this. Today I'm going to, you know, these promises God has given, so I want to put, put that in practice. You know, when we were growing up and we were children, um, it's, it's a small, it, it was a small town, it's now grown. Uh, in the town that we grew up in, you know, there was this circus, which was an annual affair, right? It was called some Gemini Circus or some circus, and we used to look forward to it, you know, as kids, and our, and our grandfather would take us, and we just, you know, I, I can literally feel the tension, you know, we're all, I'm sitting there with sweaty palms, oh, the lions will come, oh, where will they come, and, and, and all this, you know, acrobats and all that, you know, tension, and the live band that is playing, and wow, it's so exciting. Then another thing that we had was what was called the exhibition. I know it's a very dull, boring name, but it was exciting then. Right? So what did we have in the exhibition? We had all these rides. We had this giant wheel, which we never ventured. And um, we had this, you know, this huge, huge, big, gigantic uh, papadam. You know, you call it appalam. You put a lot of chili powder on top and, and you take a bite of it and the chili powder hits your face and you, know, you breathe it in and you start sneezing and all that. You know, it's part of our childhood, right? And then there are these vegetable cutting things which work very fine when he's doing the demo. But you take home and you try it, after two days it stops. <laughs> but the next day we'll go and buy it. We'll try, we look at the demo and we buy it again, right? And we also had these colored glasses, right? And me and my brother, we were fascinated. You, it was green and blue and red and yellow and we used to buy that and wear it. And my grandfather would say, hey, you guys are going to spoil your eyes. Right? We don't know what it's made of. It's some plastic and, you know, but we wore it. And then the world looks green. The world looks red, you know. The world looks psychedelic. <laughs> we wore it. And I just want to propose to us today that all of us are wearing glasses. Even those of us who have 20-20 vision, you're wearing glass spectacles. Because you're looking at the world through some lens. You're looking at the world through some lens. The question is, am I looking at it through the lens of scripture through the word of God, right? I can look it through, you know, a lens of skepticism and cynicism and, and all that and doubt and unbelief. And, and so my, my, my belief and my conviction and my actions, everything changes. The world looks green. The world looks red. Hey, this is how it is. But are we looking at it through the lens of the word of God? For a disciple, it's a word-centered life. So it's not weird or strange you know, to have the Word of God as your plumb line, as your point of reference. Right? To say that, hey, the Word doesn't permit me. It's not weird. It's not strange. It's normal. It's normal. It's normal for a disciple to have a Word-centered life. And Colossians 3 exhorts us, verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing and so on. So a word-centered life where my choice, my life and everything, um, you know, is, is governed by the word of God. And the thing, best thing is this, we can feast on it and we can go back to it. I'm sure, you know, if you had a heavy meal, the very mention of food after a heavy meal, you know, it repulses you. You're like, please don't talk to me about it. I'm full. I don't want to even to look at food pictures now, right? But the word of God, you had a full meal, but it creates an appetite for even more. Right? Your spirit can take even more. Right? It has the capacity to take even more. Because the Word of God says, with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And it talks about the Word, the revelation of God's Word. So it's a life that is centered uh, around the Word of God. Uh, so what is a normal Christian life? It is a life that is filled and led by the Holy Spirit. A spirit-filled, a spirit-led life. Now that, I don't know if that is exciting to you, but it, to me it is. Right? To have the Holy Spirit, the Creator God, living in you, living in me. 
Not only that, he's not dormant, but he's saying, hey, I want to fill you with my power and I want to lead you. Lead you in what? In all that I'm facing. In all that I'm facing, in all the bridges that I have to cross, in all the mountains that I have to move, in all the oceans that need to be parted, all through life, as a believer, he's saying to, he's given the Holy Spirit to help, so he speaks, he prompts, he leads, he guides, and he's saying, oh, I want to take you more into truth, the truth that sets you free. I want to take you more into what is this thing called life, a life that is full of life, this Zoe kind of life. So as we are led by the Spirit of God, we are the sons and daughters of God. We are the children of God. Right? And Galatians 5 and verse 16 says, walk in the Spirit. Which means, you know, make it your life to walk in the Spirit, to live your life. Let it be normal to have conversations with God. Let it be normal to ask God questions. Let it be normal to rely on Him and lean on Him for help. And say, Lord, I don't understand this. Can you teach me? Lord, I, I need to do this. Can you help me? Let it be a part of our normal conversation. And not just times of prayer. You know, where we get together or we, you know, we say, okay, this time is for prayer. But throughout the day, you know, we can rely. We can lean on the leading, the prompting, the guiding of the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit-filled, it's a spirit-led life. Man, and it's a continuous thing. Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, which means it's a continuous thing. I can go on and say, Lord, you fill me, God. And he gives us with a purpose to receive power, to be witnesses, to live this overcoming life. And that's another thing that we see that, uh, you know, Galatians 5, 16 says, walk in the spirit and you shall not. You shall not fulfill. What will you not fulfill? The longings, the forbidden longings of the flesh, the forbidden longings of my unrenewed mind. The word of God says, you walk in the spirit. You walk listening to the spirit. You walk being prompted by the spirit. And he's saying, I guarantee you, you will not fulfill all those forbidden longings. They will lose their power because you are listening to a different voice right now. Amen. So that's good news there. A supernatural life is, is what is next. A supernatural life. So we said, you know, God, it's a, it's a life of faith. It's a God's word-centered life. It's a spirit-led, spiritful life. But it's also a supernatural life. The Lord Jesus, talking to his disciples after commissioning them, Right, while commissioning them, this is what he says, right? He says, Mark 16 and verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. And he talks about supernatural things, things that you know, go beyond the natural. He talks about casting out demons and speaking with new tongues and, and serpents. And, and, and you know, it, he says, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So now, sometimes we think, you know, um, you know, I want to go after God's love, the character of God, and about all this power and supernatural things. You know, I see too much of that in the world as well. There are so many counterfeits, so, you know, I don't want to dabble in that. But the Lord's commission is this. As a normal Christian, as you go, he says, these signs will follow. In other words, John chapter 14, right, says... He who believes in me. And before that he says, most assuredly I say to you. you know, surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And then he goes on to say, greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. And we need to remind ourselves, hey, this is a normal Christian life. Sometimes we are, maybe, you know, there have been bad examples, bad role models when it came to the supernatural. The supernatural of God, the works of God in and through us, is not to elevate man. It's never to put man on a pedestal. But it's to, it is a signboard pointing to Jesus, who's the Lord of all. It is a signboard. These are signs. These are wonders that point you back to Jesus. And so, if you look at it, the gifts of the Spirit and so on, we see these are supernatural gifts, but these are expressions of the Holy Spirit. Just think about that. 
This is an expression or a display of the Holy Spirit. A display of what? Definitely His power, but it's also a display of the heart of God. Right? The heart of God, He loves us, He wants to heal. He loves us, He wants to deliver. He loves us, He wants to give a breakthrough. He loves us, so He says, hey, I'm going to give you a word. It's a word of edification, exhortation, and comfort. In other words, it's a prophetic word, but you go and share. Why? Because I care for that brother. I care for that sister. But I, I'm releasing that word through you. You go, you share, and let them give glory to the Lord. Amen. So it's the very heart of God. If you look at it, the ministry of the Lord Jesus, it says he went about doing good. He went about doing good. He was a great teacher, right? He was a, he was a great uh, orator, I think. You know, he used examples and parables and so on. But he also demonstrated the supernatural. And when we think of the supernatural, well, it is the blind eye opening. It is the organ being formed, which is not there. You know, in my case, it was the wheezing, which I had for many years, just being healed in an instant. It is the supernatural. But it's also the supernatural when you're feeling dry and when you're down and you're just sitting there and nothing is making sense. And, uh, and then suddenly you experience the love of God. You experience the life of the Holy Spirit. Well, you didn't even pray. You didn't even ask, but you're there. And the hand of God, the touch of God, it's not like that. You're thinking about something. You're trying to solve something. You are there. You are weary. You are down. And here's the supernatural work of God. The peace of God. Amidst all those storms. The love of God. Amidst all those words of accusation and discouragement. And the love of God and the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. You know, when things are so dry. When you're saying, you know, what am I doing? The Word of God doesn't make sense and, you know, just sitting there, I can't do anything. Experiencing that supernatural touch of God. Well, that's supernatural. That is supernatural as well. Amen. So we are called to this supernatural life. To experience first most, I mean, first hand, as disciples, as a normal Christian, but also we get to have the privilege of ministering the supernatural. Right, that, was the, that was what the Great Commission is about. So the supernatural life is a life of walking in God-given authority as children of God to do His works, desiring to see His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. The next thing we see is that for a normal Christian life, it's a life of loving and serving God's people. It's a life of loving and serving God's people. Uh, you may say, oh, that's easy. Hey, that's very simple. I want something difficult. But this is it. You know, this, is the, this is the difficult thing, right? It says, John 13 and verse 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another. We looked at this verse earlier. That you love one another as I have loved you. By this all will know that you are my. God is well pleased. So the disciple, having been already filled with the love of God, having already been empowered by the love of God, for the disciple, it is a life of God's love in action. It is a life of God's love in action. It is a love your neighbor as yourself lifestyle. Amen. And it's normal for the, for the disciple because we're talking about the unconditional love of God that we have in our hearts. And yes, that expression of it, there is the soul, there is the unrenewed mind, there is the flesh which hinders us. But as we walk, as we walk with the empowered by the Holy Spirit, led by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a life which is a love your neighbor lifestyle. The goodness of God revealed through the disciple melts the hardest of hearts and turns that person unto God. The goodness of God leads many to repentance. And the goodness of God, maybe it's uh, you know, acts of kindness or kind words or deeds or generosity through the disciple melts the hardest of hearts and leads many to the goodness of God, to repentance. 
to change their ways and say, hey, I want to consider God. I want to consider God. If this is the God that you are believing, if this is the lifestyle of one who follows Jesus, I want to consider. So it leads many to repentance, right? The next thing that we see is it is a life of intimacy with God. It is a life of intimacy with God. You know, I know that these are familiar things, but maybe you can see, we can say this, you know, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. Everybody, I've heard this before, but I'm going to listen intently. <laughs> okay, so we've heard this before, the love of God or, you know, intimacy with God. But this is a mark of a disciple and this is the lifestyle of a disciple. You know, John, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Saying, I, I want to draw near to you. You know, what does drawing near mean? He wants to come and, you know, put his, wrap his arms around us and say, I, I want to draw near to you. You know, I don't want you to worship me from a distance. I've made a way through my son to come to the very throne room, to the very throne, to receive grace and mercy. He wants us to draw near to him. And that's why we have this whole picture of the vine and the branch. He's saying, Abide, stay, stay in the vine. Because if you're not staying in the vine, I don't have to do anything, but the life is not flowing and you're going to wither. Saying, you stay. It's a life of pursuing the presence of God. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, and we know this, the, the, the scribe goes to the Lord and asks this question, Lord, you know, what is the greatest uh, commandment? I've kept everything, what is the greatest commandment? The Lord says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It talks about a love which just takes over and all our senses and everything and to love God in that manner. And I remember talking to this couple, uh, elderly couple, and who've been through many years of marriage, and, and so they've seen a lot, argued a lot, fought a lot, <laughs> etc., but... You know, this is what the man, you know, the, the husband said. He said, you know, uh, I, just, I just want to be with my wife. This is after many years, right? He says, I just want to be in the same room as she is. Right? Uh, I don't want to, you know, talk anything. I don't want her to say anything. She might be cooking. I just want to be where she is. I just want to be there. Right? And, and I believe, you know, when it comes to this abiding this vine and the branch, the Lord is saying, can you just be in my presence? Sometimes we think, you know, oh, okay, I need to, you know, all this is good, right? Praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, sorry, uh, meditating on the Word of God and declaring the Word of God, and we do that. You know, that is our life, that is a culture, and that is the truth. All this is good, but sometimes we make it like a workout Oh, I need the warm-up, I need to do this, and now I'm, I'm doing the, okay, what, what is it? The stretches, and, you know, I, I'm done now. The Lord is saying, can you just be? Can you just abide? Just be in my presence. Just be in my presence. Because from His presence flows hope. From His presence flows comfort. The Lord is saying, just be still and know. Just be still and no. And all those things are they're raging in your life and all this tempest and storm and things are happening. Can you just be still and know? And that word no means to experience the truth. It's an experiential word. No. Just be still and experience that I am your God. You know, was I not there when no one around, when no one was around in your mother's womb? No one was there. You were just a single cell, but I put together, I knit you together. No one was around. No one knows. But I was there, says the Lord. He knows everything about us. He knows our frame. He knows that we are dust. And he's saying, just be in my presence. Why are you running away? Just be in my presence. Sometimes we just need to keep everything aside and, you know, disconnect and say, Lord, I just want to be. I just want to be still. 
and know that you are God. Yeah, I remember I was going for a walk and, um, you know, not particularly thinking about anything, but this sense of the Lord with me, you know, just walking. It was just a morning walk and the sense, strong sense of the presence of God just being there. No exchange, no words, no petitions, nothing but the presence of God. And he's inviting us and he's saying, hey, this is normal, by the way, to abide in me, to abide in my presence, to have this life of intimacy, this closeness, it is normal. It is not weird. It is not something that say, oh, I don't want to be super spiritual. No, no, he's calling us to a relationship. He's calling us to a relationship. He's not calling us to, you know, speed dating or, you know, okay, I've done this and I'm, you know, next week, where, where? He's not calling us to that. He's calling us to a, to a covenant, to a commitment. And he's saying, you be there, you be still. This is what I want to pour out. It's okay, I'm there. I'm with you. I'm with you. Have I not promised you? You know, all these promises, God, they seem like theory, God. The Lord says, come, come. You know, I'll make it a revelation in your spirit. Hey, but you need to draw near. I want to guide you with my eyes. How can God guide us with his eyes if we don't gaze at his presence, if we don't gaze at his face? Amen. So his Lord is calling us, inviting us to a life of intimacy and to pursue his presence. Revelation 3 and verse 20, we've heard this before. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So the normal Christian life is a life of deep communion, is a life of intimate friendship with the Lord, choosing to delight his heart in worship, choosing to be hungry for more of his presence. You know, just like all the saints that we see in the Old Testament, the New, uh, Moses, after all that journey, he says, Lord, show me your glory. Paul, and after all that ministry and everything, he says, Lord, oh, that I might know you and the power of your resurrection. So we might ask Paul, Paul, have you not experienced more of God? Have you not seen it all? Have you not ministered, Paul? And Paul says, no, I, that I may know him. And in another place, he says, you know, I count everything. You know, all that position and privilege that was there as a Pharisee. And, you know, I count all that, all my training and learning and all that. I count it as rubbish, he says. I count it as refuse compared to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And that he uses a very hard word. He uses the word, strong word, you know, refuse or garbage or excreta. He says, this is all done compared to the beauty of the Lord Amen. How did he come to that place from a place of relationship? You don't, you know, come to that place from a place of, you know, ritual and a compartmentalized life. But no, he's calling us to a normal Christian life of intimacy and fellowship. Okay. Last couple of things. We see that it is a life of integrity and holiness and purity. Integrity, holiness, purity, marked or pillars in our lives, in the life of a normal Christian. Why? Because the Lord says, um, you know, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, the apostle says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He walked with grace. He walked with truth. So we are called to imitate. It's a life of imitating the Lord Jesus. To imitate the Lord Jesus. 1 Peter 1 and verse 15, um, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So it's not an option. Holiness, a pursuit of a, of a higher pleasure. A pursuit of Christ-likeness. And so it's a life of imitating the Lord Jesus, walking in sanctification and honor consecrating ourselves, and it is a joy and privilege to do that. Amen. Amen. And lastly, it's a life of witnessing. It's a life of witnessing where we say, hey, I've experienced Jesus, and I testify, and I say, he is all that he says he is. Yes, it is true. Look at my life. He changed my life. It's a life of witnessing, but it's a life of witnessing with 
power. Yes, we witness with our words. We say, we witness with our life and say, okay, let my life speak, which is louder, let my action speak, which is louder than words. But it's a life of demonstration of the power of God. Because he's called us to this, right? Um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus uh, asking the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And he says, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. You shall receive power and you shall receive witnesses. To me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the normal Christian life is to walk in power, is to witness in power. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. Uh, we'll close with this. just want to invite the worship team to come up. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 33, it says, And with great power, the apostles gave witness. With great power, the apostles gave witness. What did they give witness to? They gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Right? With great power, they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So who were these people? The disciples of the Lord. They were living the normal Christian life and with great power, they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord. The Lord today is, you know, is inviting us to something that is very normal. Right? Maybe for some of us, it's, it's a realignment. Maybe it's a new normal, but it's a normal Christian life. And it's an invitation. And sometimes we think, we have questions, you know, how and why and, and how can I do it? And, and we look at the, you know, the, the natural aspect of it. We look at our own lives and but the Lord is inviting and is saying, you know, I've, I've got something better. You know, I am there in you. I am empowering you to live out this normal Christian life. Amen. Amen. So it's a high call and it's an invitation. It's a call to walk in joy. It's a call to walk in, in all the, all the thing that comes with the kingdom of God. And it's saying, he's saying, you know, you do this. You walk in this path and live the normal Christian life. Now, shall we all stand? And, um, the normal Christian life is a life of faith. It's a word-centered life. It's a spirit-filled and spirit-led life. It's a supernatural life. A life of loving and serving God's people. A life of intimacy, a great closeness with God and pursuing His presence. A life of integrity and holiness and purity. A life of witnessing with power. It's an exciting life. Amen. It's not a boring life. Yes, are there troubles and are there, you know, tribulations? Yes, are there challenges? Yes. But it's an overcoming life nevertheless. And it's a normal Christian life. Amen. Amen. So let's just, uh, you know, as we turn our, turn our focus to God, maybe we can pray and ask the Lord, Lord, I want this normal Christian life. Lord, I want this to be my new normal. You know, I realize that I've, I've been living fall, I mean, far below the normal. But Lord, I want to live the normal Christian life. I want to align my heart to yours. I want to see the world the way you see it. I want to see the world, see people, see you, Lord, through the lenses of Scripture, lens of Scripture. I want to walk in faith, God. I want to walk with your word being the center of my life, to order my life. I want to be led by you, Holy Spirit. I want to be mentored by you, Holy Spirit, even as you train, teach, equip, remind I want to live a supernatural life because it is your heart. It is your love for me and for the people around. The humanity that is hurting needs your power, needs your touch. So we want to live that supernatural life. We want to live a life of integrity and purity and holiness. We want to live a life, God, that, that is witnessing with power. We want to live this life, God. Let's worship the Lord even as we talk to Him and just invite His presence. All to Jesus I surrender. 
surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. things that we've been holding, God. I surrender And I will build my life. The rock that never shakes No 
turning back and no turning back no turning back the world behind me the world oh your cross the cross did oh god the world Turning back, no turning back, yeah, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, what a joy it is to follow you, God. What a joy it is to follow the voice of the shepherd. Yes, Lord, you're the good shepherd. You care for us, you love us, God. You've come that we might have life in its fullness. And you've called us to this life. We thank you. You're inviting us to this life. We thank you. It leads to life. It leads to goodness. And you are with us every step of the way. You know, if, if, if there's anyone here and you're saying, you know, I, yeah, I have a Christian name. I'm, I am a churchgoer. But I have never, ever invited Jesus into my heart. He says, follow me. He says all that. But I have never, ever invited Jesus so you know you can do that and just a simple prayer and say Lord Jesus I believe that you died for me on the cross you took my sin you took everything that was separating me from you you took it on the cross and you died and you rose again and I believe that so we can invite Jesus you can pray and invite Jesus and say Lord Jesus come into my heart be my Lord truly you can sing it with conviction and say I have decided to follow Jesus so if there's anyone here and you've prayed that prayer or would like to pray that prayer you know, can I just see your hand anyone for the first time you want to pray that prayer or you've prayed that prayer saying Jesus come into my heart anyone anyone watching online as well uh, okay I don't see any hands but uh, if you made that prayer or if you would like to pray that prayer you know you can say back so we can talk to you and, and uh, pray with you as well right and if you come with friends stay with your friends and pray that prayer and for those of us you know let's rise up to the new normal and say yeah this is the normal Christian life it's not weird it's not strange but it's biblically scriptural so I'm going to live that normal Christian life hallelujah You know, we can invite the power of God to touch us and change us right now. The God kind of life, the Zoe God kind of life is flowing in us. And so whatever is not aligned to the word of God, maybe it's some symptom in our bodies, maybe it's some breakthroughs that we need, something that we are contending for, maybe it's some, something to do with finances, something to do with relationships, something to do with the home, something to do with the child, something to do with, you know, whatever. You know, can we just say, Lord, let your Zoe, God kind of life, even that is flowing, Lord, let it change things at the level of my cell, God. Let it change things at the level of my uh, tissue and organ. Yes, Lord, you are the supernatural God. Yes, Lord, this is your heart. And so, yes, Master, change, God. I receive it. I receive it. You know, let there be expectation in the love of God to change things. May there be breakthroughs released in our lives. Just say, I receive it in Jesus' name. You know, maybe it's finances. Just say, I receive it in Jesus' name. Maybe it's something to do with sicknesses and, and you know, long-standing you know, symptoms, stubborn symptoms. Say, Lord, I receive, oh God, that healing because you said it is done. And so I come in agreement and I receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name, God. We thank you that you walk with us. You're always with us. Oh, such great love. Such deep assurance. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for calling us your friends. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, 
the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us remain with us even as we fellowship with him every moment both now and the days ahead in Jesus name amen 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 thank you for listening we trust this message was a blessing to you for more free resources including sermons sermon notes and books please visit apcwo.org for information on apc bible college in bangalore visit apcbiblecollege.org do remember to download the all people's church bangalore app from the apple or google play store